Welcome, and thank you for joining our third panel discussion looking at U.S. electoral issues through the lens of the 2005 Carter Baker Commission on Federal Election Reform. I'm John Williams, a fellow of the Presidential Elections Program at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. We're proud to organize this event in five-part series with the Carter Center. The Carter Center and the Baker Institute are nonpartisan organizations founded by former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James A. Baker. 16 years ago, President Carter and Secretary Baker came together to co-chair a bipartisan commission that made a series of recommendations about ways to build confidence in U.S. elections. Today, debate about election reform continues to rage. Americans are deeply divided, and politicians often seem more interested in exploiting those divides rather than search for common ground. In this context, we thought it was important to bring together smart, reasonable people for constructive discussions about how we might be able to strengthen our electoral processes, and ultimately in doing that, strengthen our democracy. We're lucky to have with us today a group of highly regarded election officials and experts to speak about voter registration and voter ID. Our panelists are David Becker, Executive Director and, and Founder of the Center for Election Innovation and Research. Joshua A. Douglas, the Ashland Spears Distinguished Research Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky J. David Rosenberg College of Law. Tony Johnson, Chairwoman of the Hines County Mississippi Election Commission and Kathleen Unger, Founder, President and Chairman of the Board of Vote Riders. Once again, our moderator today is Doug Chapin, Director of Election Research for the Fours Marsh Group. Doug also served as Director of Research for the 2005 Carter Baker Commission. After this discussion, David Car Carroll of the Carter Center will offer a few closing remarks and then provide information about our next session. But first, we start with this video. In 2005, the United States was in its fifth year of efforts to reform its election system. The hotly contested and controversial 2000 presidential election had identified flaws in the nation's registration and voting laws that were seen to contribute to a lack of confidence in election outcomes. A 2002 bill called the Help America Vote Act, or HAVA, addressed some of those issues, but failed to settle all of the arguments that had arisen around election reform. For example, State laws requiring voters to provide photo identification were generating backlash amid claims of disenfranchisement. Worry about new voting technology was leading to fears of counting errors. And growing numbers of absentee and mail ballots were raising concerns about the possibility of fraud. In response, former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker III agreed to co-chair a bipartisan commission housed at Washington, D.C.'s American University to examine these and other outstanding election reform issues. The final report, entitled Building Confidence in U.S. Elections, stressed the important role of elections to the nation's democracy and made a series of recommendations, some controversial at the time, that sought to protect access to polls and the integrity of the election process. Today, many of the challenges that the Commission recognized have been addressed and are now familiar aspects of the American voting experience yet they remain central to current election reform debates. In this panel series, we are revisiting key issues in the Carter-Baker Report and assessing how they can help foster constructive dialogue on election reforms. Today's topic is voter registration and voter ID. On this issue, the 2005 Commission Report noted the following. Effective voter registration and voter identification are bedrocks of a modern election system. By assuring uniformity to both voter registration and voter identification, and by having states play an active role in registering as many qualified citizens as possible, access to elections and ballot integrity will both be enhanced. To implement these recommendations, the Commission endorsed the use of a federal Real ID card as a form of voter ID, and stressed that where voters will need identification for voting, IDs should be easily available and issued free of charge. In the 16 years since the Commission issued its recommendations, the issue of expanded registration and voter ID has been a constant concern. In today's discussion, we'll look more closely at this issue with a focus on both registration and voter ID 
keeping in mind the ultimate goal of building confidence in U.S. elections. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, as John said, my name is Doug Chapin from the Forest Marsh Group in Northern Virginia. Um, really honored to be a part of this panel series, looking back at the 2005 Carter Baker Commission and report, uh, and really excited about uh, our four guests today. Uh, we'll start with just a, a quick round of opening questions to each of our panelists, followed by uh, a brief moderator discussion. Uh, and then uh, at the end, uh, hopefully we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers from the audience, which you can access through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So welcome uh, to everyone. And I actually, I'd like to start with uh, Tony Johnson from uh, Mississippi. Um, Tony, uh, as an election official in the state of Mississippi, uh, you're responsible for all aspects of the voting process in your county. Um, how have policy changes, especially those involving registration and ID, uh, changed how you and your colleagues do your job day to day? Well, good morning. I'm so glad to be here. To answer your question, here in Mississippi, uh, we all know that we're in the southern part of the country. So the voter registration process and the voter ID has been more of, of a problematic issue here um, than it has been um, a helping process for voters and constituents. So for us here in Mississippi, voter registration um, is not expanded to the same day. Here by law, it has to be done 30 days before the election. Uh, we can't do it online. Um, and so that poses an issue. Um, even though it's statewide, the same rules, we have a lot of people that may move in or, or transfer that want to register to vote uh, that are very surprised that if they are within 30 days of the election, then their voter registration form basically will not count until the next election. And so we're still having issues on expanding that uh, we can't do it online in today's technology. And of course, uh, due to COVID, everything basically went online. And so it's very problematic that someone can't log on to a secured website with the Secretary of State, submit their information online for a voter registration application and become a registered voter here in Hines County. Um, and it's not on the same day. There are many states across the country that if you move here today on a Monday, that you can vote on a Monday, even if the election is the next day. And so that's problematic here in Mississippi. So, so those are some of the things as far as voter registration that we are trying to expand. As it comes to our voter ID um, laws, we didn't always have voter ID. Voter ID uh, over the last 10 years was put on the books as a state law. The issue that we have, we see a lot of older people in rural communities um, that don't drive. Some people may just have ID cards that have problems getting to your clerk's office to get an actual ID card before an election have to bring documents like a birth certificate, uh, a social security card, and in some instances that pose the problem for people that can't find them or, you know, readily put their hands on them. One of the most recent issues that we've had with the voter ID laws here are our transgender community um, in the LBGT community. Going into the polling locations, I had to do a, a series of trainings um, to the poll managers just basically saying you can't turn anyone away, their driver's license may say one thing, but their actual physical appearance may be something else. But yet and still, they, they do have the right to vote. So those are some of the issues that we see on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis with every election as it relates to the voter ID, um, as well as the voter registration. And then people always pose the questions, well, I don't wanna do it. And we say, well, we don't really have a choice. It's a legislative issue. Um, the county commissioners and the clerks, we don't really have a say so in that other than to give our opinion, but at the end of the day, it's handled at the state legislature. Those are a few of the issues that we have here on our end. Thank you and uh, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. I want to turn next to um, Professor Douglas. Um, Josh, you are a law professor, um, but one I know who has um, worked very hard to understand um, and work with state and local election administrators um, through the years. What's your take on how um, their work uh, has been affected by policy changes in the area of voter ID and voter registration over the last 16 years or so? Thanks, Doug, uh, for that question. And thanks to you and to the Baker Institute and the Carter Center for having me on this, uh, this really stellar panel and, and such an important discussion. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to, to look back, particularly on the issue of voter ID over the past 16 years and the way in which the Carter Baker report, as outlined in that video, has 
has influenced the debate and thereby influenced the work of local election administrators. And, and let me say at the outset that local election administrators are the heroes of the 2020 election and of our elections in general. I mean, talking about protecting the right to vote uh, is it, all come down to county clerks and county uh, election officials and the poll workers on the ground who, who did an incredible job in a time in which there was so much distrust and then you throw a pandemic on top of it uh, and yet pulled off a, a highly successful 2020 election. You know, as a law professor, you know, I, I think about the laws and I think about the court decisions surrounding them and I think about policy implementation and then how that will impact people on the ground. And one way that I think the Carter Baker report has been used and, and probably misused is by uh, too readily trying to summarize its conclusion uh, without looking at the nuances. And the nuances are really important. So we hear people say, including the US Supreme Court, uh, or at least uh, uh, several justices on the US Supreme Court in a, an opinion written by Justice Stevens about Indiana's photo ID law, that the Carter Baker report endorsed photo ID laws. Uh, and then you hear people talk about that case, this case called Crawford, and they say that the Supreme Court upheld voter ID laws. And neither is really accurate. The Carter Baker report endorsed a form of a photo ID requirement phased in an appropriate time period uh, with appropriate safeguards for voters to make sure people are not disenfranchised. And the US Supreme Court in that 2008 case didn't uphold the Indiana photo ID law. It refused to invalidate it because the plaintiffs didn't have enough evidence in that case of the harms that the law would impose. And those two are, things are very different, right? The court did not explicitly endorse and say, photo ID law is good and constitutional. It said the plaintiffs in this case about the Indiana law don't have enough evidence. And, and I bring those two things up because what I think we see is this push over the last decade for stricter and stricter photo ID requirements. And it's important to note that not all photo ID laws are created equal. States vary in the kinds of IDs allowed, uh, in the measures that poll workers must take if you don't have an ID, in the ability to cast a, uh, a regular ballot if you sign an affidavit as to why you don't have an ID as opposed to a provisional ballot that makes the voter do something else and jump through additional hoops after election day. And so to, to answer your question more directly, how has it affected the local election administrators, the, the heroes on the ground? They're having to deal with all of these different rules in every different state, and often the rules are changing. You look at states like Wisconsin with uh, judicial opinions going back and forth leading up to the election on photo ID, and they have to keep track of all of this to run a successful election. Now, you know, 80% of the voters or whatever number I'm making that up, but many voters aren't going to have a problem with a photo ID requirement, but it's those other percentage that are going to have an issue and that holds up the line that makes the poll workers make sure that they use the proper protocols. And every election we hear of, of poll workers, again, who are the heroes, but sometimes people make mistakes and people get turned away. And so there's a lot of chaos involved, I think, in this misunderstanding of what the Carter Baker report said and this misunderstanding of what the US Supreme Court actually did in that 2008 opinion. Thank you. Um, it was an eventful 16 years and that was actually a pretty useful distillation. Um, I, I really appreciate that and I'm glad you're here. Um, I wanna turn next to, um, to David. David, um, I know we'll talk some about voter ID today, but um, voter registration is important as well. And I don't, think I can think of anybody um, who was more intimately involved with a lot of the changes that we've seen um, since the Carter Baker report in the area of registration, whether it's the expansion of online registration or increased interstate sharing of voter registration data. How do those changes and any others that you think are important affect um, the issues that the Carter Baker report looked at, um, including but not limited to voter ID? Um, thanks so much, Doug. Thanks for having me on the panel, and thanks especially to the Baker Institute and the Carter Center for putting on this series, which is outstanding. Um, one thing I realized, it, it, this was such a great opportunity to go back and actually look at the report. And one of the things I realized is how, and it, you showed it on a slide, how inextricably intertwined the ideas of access to the ballot and ballot integrity are. Those two things are linked, and that balance must be maintained. 
we could build a system that was very, very accessible, but lacked any semblance of integrity. We could say, write your vote on a slip of paper, seal it up with bubble gum and toss it at your election office or text it to someone. Would have no integrity whatsoever. We could also say, you have to go to a cement bunker and give a blood sample and a DNA sample to vote on a, during a two hour window. That would not be accessible. We're constantly trying to find this balance. And I think this goes to Josh's point very well, which is that um, the, whenever anyone tried to pick one element of the Carter Baker report that they liked, but didn't talk about it in context and nuance, as Josh put it, um, they were really doing a disservice to the overall recommendations, which were really tied to this idea of a balance between integrity and access. And I, I think the voter registration conversation is actually one of the um, one place where that's very, very evident. We've just been through an election where um, the losing candidate has been using lies or tiny administrative errors to try to leverage the idea that there was a massive integrity problem, even though this election was the single most secure, transparent, and verified election in American history. And it's really a testament to people like you, Tony, and other election officials on the ground who managed this with the highest turnout we've ever seen in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm still in awe about this. And when the pandemic is over, rather than the death threats that many of you have received, I hope we throw a parade for you all because um, it's been a tremendous, uh, it, it, a tremendous success. We should be celebrating it. But all of us can see, regardless of what our political persuasion, that both access and integrity are important. We want the loser's supporters to feel as if the election had integrity. And we want to give as little um, ground to the loser's supporters and the loser's campaign to try to allege there wasn't integrity. Um, so voter registration is where this all starts. And um, Doug knows, Doug and I worked on this both when we were at Pew. Um, when we talk to election officials, all of them will acknowledge voter registration is the, is the single biggest point of failure or point of success in a system. Um, Oftentimes we try to distill this too simplistically into, we wanna get as many people on the voter lists um, and limit list maintenance, limit removing any of those people, or we wanna remove as many people from the voter list because we think they're not eligible. And we don't really care about easy access. Both are incredibly wrong ways of looking at this. If you ask election professionals like Tony and her colleagues, what every single one of them will tell you is we want as many eligible voters on the list as possible. And we want accurate information on them. And we only want eligible voters. If they moved out of my state, I want them registered in their new state. We all do. And, um, and so one of the things that the, Barker, the, the Carter Baker report helped spur was a discussion about this and how voter registration could serve this, this very, very important role. And uh, as election officials considered this, what we realized was um, Voter lit, cleaning up the lists, voter list maintenance, that's not a bad thing. It's only bad when it's done badly. We don't wanna take the wrong people off the lists, but when it's done right, it actually updates people, people's records to their correct address. So we know where they are. We can send them information on where their correct polling place is and when their next election is, and they can vote with confidence and knowledge. And so, um, you know, back, back at Pew, Doug and I worked on something called the Electronic Registration Information Center, or ERIC for short. Um, it was founded in 2012 after several years of discussions. And I think it really um, made real some of the recommendations that the Carter Baker report really only imagined back in 2005, which was states sharing information securely so that they could identify when they had a new voter in their state that they might wanna get registered or when they had someone on their voter list where the information was no longer accurate, either because they moved in state or because they moved out of state or perhaps because they died. And that if we could do this accurately, if we could limit the ability to remove someone who shouldn't be removed, but accurately update records that should be updated, we'd have something really important on our hands. And so this has gone hand in hand with things like um, automated uh, motor voter, some people call it automatic voter registration. I actually think it's just a, um, a, an extension, a technological extension of what the National Voter Registration Act of 1993 envisioned, which was that when you go into a state agency, you get registered and your information is updated. Trying to keep that stuff up to date 
and using tools like Eric, which now was started with seven states back in 2012. And I'm still amazed we're at 30 states in Eric today. Uh, that number is going to grow in just the next few months. About two thirds of all American voters live in an Eric state. Eric has both updated over 10 million records of people who've moved in their states that their information was accurate, but it's also resulted in probably around 20 million, um, somewhere between 10 and 20 million new registered voters because states have been reaching out and contacting them. So having accurate information has been just incredibly important to kind of turn down the heat and turn off the light in this conversation. I think um, Josh, is, Josh was completely right. You know, the, the, the uh, hardcore partisans who are trying to game the system to achieve some kind of electoral outcome will pick and choose portions of the report that they liked. Um, you'll often hear that Jimmy Carter uh, recommended voter ID. That's not accurate. It's out of context. It is what he did was he said, if voter ID was fully accessible to everybody and tied to universal registration, and Secretary Baker said the same thing, that would be a good tie between election access and election integrity. And those are the kinds of things we're striving for. I, as you pointed out, and, and um, the, the Carter Baker report is, is, was a key element in this, we are much farther along now 16 years later, um, thanks to the hard work of many, um, including President Carter and Secretary Baker. Thank you. I, I, I will say as a, um, as a recovering lawyer and former law student, I, I have a very strong sense that bubble gum and concrete bunkers may show up in one of Josh's exam questions at some point um, down the line. Um, I'm glad I won't be in that class. Um, last but not least, I want to turn to, um, to Kathleen Unger. Uh, Kathleen, um, your organization, Vote Riders, was formed in large part in response to increased uh, ID requirements at the state and local level. Um, can you tell us a little more about the work of Vote Riders um, and how you help voters navigate these policy changes we've seen in the area of registration and voter ID? Certainly, and thank you, Doug, and to the Carter Baker Commission for uh, uh, inviting me to join this uh, incredible panel and important discussion. Uh, so uh, Vote Writers focuses on voter ID to ensure that American citizens can vote with confidence uh, knowing they cannot be turned away. Indeed, we ensured uh, that almost one and a half million new voters in the 2020 cycle uh, were prepared to cast a ballot that counted plus many millions more through uh, our celebrity ambassadors social media. Vote Writers is a national nonpartisan uh, 501c3 nonprofit that I founded over nine years ago. Uh, to uh, identify uh, citizens who have uh, uh, voter ID issues, to educate them, and to help them obtain the ID that they need, which we do soup to nuts from, um, from uh, uh, you know, gathering and paying for the documents that they need, uh, and the ID oftentimes, and arranging for and paying for transportation to and from the ID issuing offices. We're assisted by over 5,500 volunteers, including seven of the top 50 global law firms. And uh, we work with and through over 730 uh, partner organizations um, and uh, 25 to 40 million voting age Americans do not have a government issued photo ID. And there are many millions more, many, uh, who are so confused and intimidated by these complicated and ever-changing laws that they won't vote even though they have a valid ID. And there are two basic sources of the confusion. One is to understand that voter ID is in addition to and different from voter registration and that voter ID is different from in addition to voter registration ID. Uh, and of course, um, there's just uh, North Dakota is the only state that does not require a uh, voter registration, but they more than make up for it by having the most onerous voter ID law in the country. So uh, eligible American uh, uh, citizens who are disproportionately impacted by voter ID laws are 
uh, communities of color, uh, students and, and young uh, uh, people, uh, older adults who may no longer be driving, uh, people with disabilities, low-income voters who may be experiencing homelessness, uh, married women who change their names, and, and as Tony had mentioned, uh, uh, transgendered uh, voters. Vote writers, tools and services that we provide both directly to citizens and to our partners include state-specific uh, voter ID information wallet cards. Here's an example of the one from uh, Wisconsin and that we ship these uh, for free to other 501c3 organizations that have a plan to distribute them. And they are freely downloadable from our, our website. And along with our wallet cards, our chatbot, um, the uh, texting and Facebook messenger and our helpline are, are bilingual. Our website, votewriters.org uh, is uh, uniquely comprehensive uh, accurate and, and up-to-date, very important, again, given the ever-changing laws. Um, both in person and virtually, our staff and, and trained volunteers, including um, staff of our partner organizations, follow up with leads uh, uh, that have been sent to us by our partners, such as um, uh, Rock the Vote, which recently sent referred to us uh, over 55,000 names of, of voters with uh, uh, ID issues. Um, uh, they, they reach out to our volunteers and uh, reach out to um, at-risk voters through letter writing, text banking, phone banking. Uh, our, our staff and, and trained volunteers conduct very, very effective uh, voter ID clinics initially in the five states where we have on the ground coordinators. So that's Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, and Wisconsin. So in person, especially at congregate settings like shelters, uh, virtually again, uh, by uh, uh, dealing with caseworkers from partner organizations uh, like uh, the Salvation Army. Uh, our, our trained volunteers conduct research through our, our Vote Reachers program uh, that um, uh, uh, selects and initiates potential partnerships with direct service providers like shelters and food banks and food pantries and libraries and schools, uh, senior and, and other community centers, health clinics, um, faith institutions, barber shops and beauty shops. Um, and then um, a pro bono counsel at the law firms of Mayor Brown and, and Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe uh, handles securely uh, voters IDs under our photocopy my ID program when those voters need uh, a hard copy of their ID to accompany an absentee ballot application or indeed the ballot itself. So anyway. More to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you can tell already we're um, well on the way to having a, a fantastic discussion. I want to pick up on something that I know um, was threaded through uh, more than one of your answers. Um, uh, as Josh and others pointed out, um, the Carter Baker report is often cited for the proposition that the commission endorsed voter ID, but what often frequently gets lost um, is the accompanying um, recommendation or insistence that um, such IDs be um, easy, easily available uh, and free of charge. Um, just want to kind of throw it out to the panel. Why is that second piece so important um, to that ever important balance between access and integrity in elections? I'll start really quickly is just a thought, which is I often hear, well, other countries have have voter ID. And other countries have national policies of photo ID that essentially acts as their ticket to a lot of government services. We don't have anything like that in the United States. 
Um, we don't even have it at the state level because the driver's license partially acts as that, but it doesn't act as that in, like that for every in every way. So there are countries like many countries in Europe, like Mexico, that have accepted the burden of giving every single citizen an ID that follows them for life and maintaining the database that goes along with that. And it's effectively their ticket to vote. Um, voter registration becomes much less, less important if you know you have a single magic list of all citizens and where they live at any given point in time. We don't have anything close to that. Um, I mean, we, we had to build ERIC, for instance, which is an effort to share data across state lines. And in 30 states, that involves well over 60 different databases, and it's still not a national list, and it was never intended to be a national list because um, it still doesn't include all the people. So I think that's one of the things, and I, I mean, Kathleen's group does amazing work in this space because government in the United States has not accepted that responsibility to get every single uh, citizen a, um, a card that can be a ticket to government services, including voting. Uh, so to, to, to David's point, uh, the, the recommendation was uh, really wonderful, but the, but the devil is in the details. So the idea itself may be free, but the required underlying documents like the certified copy of your birth certificate or of a marriage license or, of um, you know, a court ordered uh, name change are not free. A and state agencies want you to submit an ID in order to obtain uh, the certified copy of your birth certificate or uh, to uh, get a, uh, a replacement social security card, which is an obvious uh, catch 22 conundrum because you're trying to get these documents in order to to obtain the ID. Uh, the, the Social Security Administration will accept um, a, a, you know, a few alternatives like a medical record uh, on with key identifying identification information on the medical provider's letterhead signed by the medical provider, um, which is among other things uh, involves an expense. Uh, then perhaps you can uh, uh, provide your high school or post-secondary uh, transcript. Um, but there's a whole segment of eligible voters who um, have none of these items, let alone, frankly, a phone or transportation. Um, you know, again, we can be up to 100 miles to get to the to the nearest DMV office that, that issues an ID. And then seven states so far issue only real IDs, which requires you to go to the ID issuing office in person and bring with you either if you have a current passport uh, that otherwise you need to bring uh, an original certified copy of your birth certificate and each and every name change since then, plus a limited, uh, limited types of, of documents to prove your full social security number, a social security card, pay stub, W-2 or 1099. And then you need two documents to prove your residency, which can be an issue for any living situation where there are at least two adults age 18 and over, where oftentimes all the bills go to one person and how's the other person supposed to prove their residence. So um, there, are, there are a lot of hoops to jump through. Let me also add a, a perspective about what are we trying to do here, right? I mean, and so why have a photo ID requirement? Uh, it's this is some so some so-called integrity measure, right? And so the question is, okay, what kind of fraud does an ID law prevent? And the answer is only in-person impersonation, someone showing up to the polls and pretending to be someone they're not. And we know over from years of studying and years of people looking for it that that kind of fraud is virtually non-existent. It's not to say it never happens, but it's almost. Uh, almost never happens. And so, you know, you ask, why do we need to make sure IDs are free and easily accessible? Well, because if you if the balance out the number of people who are going to be disenfranchised, 
by a photo ID law because they don't have the underlying documentation. They can't jump through the hoops that Kathleen was talking about and compare that to the number of fraudulent votes that are going to be deterred. The balance is way up, right? You're just not going to deter that kind of voter fraud. I not to say voter fraud, minimal as it is, really election fraud uh, occasionally occurs, but in-person impersonation is just so rare. And it's also a really terrible way if you wanted to throw an election, you know, and you're not going to do it in that measure. And so why do we have to make sure that the IDs, if we're going to have an ID law, because it makes people feel better about the system and makes them feel like the system is more secure, uh, we need to make sure we're doing so in a way that doesn't disenfranchise. And, you know, this was the point that um, my election law professor when I was in law school, Spencer Overton, who was on the Carter Baker Commission and wrote a dissent on this very point. He was worried that uh, that the, the people would use the Carter Baker's report and recommendation on this particular point as a weapon to, uh, to really politicize the issue of photo ID. And, and um, unfortunately, he was right about that aspect of it. Um, and so we need to be ever presently thinking about how do we ensure that if we're going to have a photo ID requirement, we make it as both mild as possible in terms of not being onerous, uh, as well as make sure that as you know, everyone can either vote with an ID or have a good faith fail safe mechanism. Uh, I'm actually proud of the work we've done in Kentucky to do that. Uh, we passed a new photo ID law last year, but I think it's it, it achieves a lot of those goals. And I'm happy to talk about that later on in the session. But those are the things we need to consider when we are talking about the different flavors of photo ID laws and, and the reason why they even exist. And, and, and just what, one last little bit about um, about uh, you know the limitations that different states have that are not particularly helpful. So uh, Georgia uh, Georgia's strict photo ID law will allow a, um, a, a you know a student ID from a public uh, university, but not a private one. Um, in Wisconsin. Uh, most of the 16 University of Wisconsin campuses, student IDs are not voter ID compliant. Um, so, I mean, there are many examples, but I just thought I would throw in a few there. So, um, real IDs have come up in a couple of your answers. Um, and uh, obviously that was uh, a big part of the recommendation of the Carter Baker Commission back in 2005. Um, that was back when the Real ID program was in its relative infancy. Um, we are now in 2021 um, and the upcoming uh, 2021 deadline um, has been extended um, yet again um, for uh, folks to get um, a Real ID in order to um, use it for things like boarding flights uh, and what have you. Um, in the absence of um, an existing ID like the ones that David talked about in other countries, what sorts of things can states and localities do to give people the kind of ID they need to cast a ballot uh, in their community elections? So I'll, I'll jump in on that one. So here, the issue we've had there are several forms of acceptable uh, voter ID. Um, there tends to be confusion around what, what is acceptable and what isn't here um, with voters. I think that's the education portion. There is a voter ID card that is simple, very similar to the real ID that can be issued by your local clerk's office that is acceptable statewide that voters can use if they don't have any of the required forms of voter ID that are on the list. Um, the kicker to that is, as Kathleen said, you have to find documents like your birth security card to prove that you are this person, even in order to get this ID card. And so I guess the answer to the question would be a generic legal ID card across the board that people can get from their local clerk's office. And more of the issue would be, how do they obtain those? Because obviously if they had the photo ID needed, they wouldn't need the actual ID issued by the clerk's office. So it's just a, it's a, a twofold issue there. 
Yeah, I just chime in really quickly. I mean, I, I think the first thing we have to recognize, it's been nearly around two decades since the Real ID law passed and we're still not fully Real ID compliant. Um, we are nowhere close to having a single national ID card. Um, we don't even have a mechanism or, or, or a, um, uh, an agency for that. Um, so that's likely not coming. I think the solution that some states have, have found, Michigan comes to mind, um, strikes me as a proper balance. And again, all of this is balancing integrity uh, versus access. And Josh is exactly right. We have to ask ourselves what we're using, what, we're, what do we have this for? Is this, is this actually achieving any goal? And does it have potential side effects that could harm eligible voters who might otherwise be turned away? And so states have found balances with not only a lot of different types of IDs, but if voters show up and they're eligible, they, um, they are not turned away if they lack an ID. They can sign an affidavit that says, I am who I say I am. And uh, there's a relatively small number of affidavits. I remember talking to state election officials in Michigan and the number of affidavits they get statewide in Michigan in a presidential election is somewhere in the two to 300 range. If you think that fraud is rampant, I can tell you as a former federal prosecutor in election law, um, two to 300 affidavits, you can look through, you can see if there's fraud. They have not found any fraud. They look through them all the time and they never find them. But I think the important thing is there needs to be a rule to make sure that if someone doesn't have ID, that they don't get turned away if they're otherwise eligible. Um, and, that, and ultimately, if you're willing to combat this very, very rare occurrence of voter impersonation fraud, which as Josh indicated, it's hardly the crime of the century. Um, you're, you're risking multiple years in jail and many thousands of dollars in fines for the ability to cast one additional ballot uh, in, a, in an election where 160 million ballots were cast. And by the way, you're showing your face to multiple witnesses and creating a ream of documentary evidence that will be used to convict you. Um, so it doesn't happen very often, hardly at all. But if we really want to create some kind of either um, disincentive to try um, and perception of integrity in the process, as long as it doesn't provide for otherwise eligible voters who through no fault of their own don't have their ID. Or, you know, honestly, even if they just forgot it, I mean, we, you shouldn't have to go home and get your ID, you're an eligible voter. Um, then a thing like an affidavit alternative can be a good option. And let me just piggyback on that to say that uh, the, the specific forms of the affidavit, making sure it's clear and not intimidating, and also what happens afterwards are really important, right? So there's a big difference between you can fill out an affidavit and cast a provisional ballot, which is set aside, and then you have to go to the county clerk's office uh, within a week of the election or something like that. Or you fill out the affidavit and you can get in line with like every other voter and vote via a regular ballot. Uh, you know, and that is really important. It's something that I really pushed forward when Kentucky was considering its photo ID law is, okay, we need the reasonable impediment form. And those voters should, have, should be able to vote just like everybody else and not have to jump through additional hoops. Um, because there is a deterrence effect from a photo ID law. It's not just the uh, um, inability to cast a ballot. It's all this, you hear, hear so much about it and you think, well, I don't have the stuff, I don't have the required thing, so I'm just not even going to bother to show up. Or if you do show up and you have to fill out a provisional ballot, well, now I have to go take another trip. Uh, we need to minimize all of those barriers if we're going to do something like have a photo ID law that, uh, you know, in the name of election integrity. Those are all really just excellent points that uh, affidavit uh, would make a, a, a world of difference at just, you know, attesting to the fact you are who you say you are and to Josh's point about having it be clear and, uh, you know, something that people can understand when they're signing it. Uh, uh, and with a provisional ballot, um, I mean, it could be you know, under the new Montana law, it, you have to uh, show up with your ID uh, by 5 p.m. the day after the election. So, you know, there's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's onerous. Um, you know, if, if states wanted to uh, be uh, more helpful, uh, they could um, provide the required underlying documents for free, just as they you know, often do for the ID itself. Um, uh, they could train staff to serve as caseworkers to help individuals 
uh, regardless of the obstacles uh, that that uh, they 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 face. Uh, uh, then there's uh, Wisconsin's ID petition process, which is uh, a, a very helpful for people who don't have all the documents. You just go to the DMV and you. Uh, fill out some forms and you bring whatever documents you have and then it's uh, the, the state that that tries to apply to to find the documents that are needed in the meantime they issue to the voter a temporary receipt that can be used for voting uh, purposes only so that the individual can actually vote uh, broadly uh, state and local governments uh, uh, we would like to see them uh, uh, provide uh, widespread uh, voter education and offers of assistance through earned media, through social media, all the way to a granular outreach the way they do for, uh, they've done for the Affordable Care Act and they're doing for uh, COVID outreach. So on that score of, of, of state outreach, wondered um, first Tony and then maybe Josh in Kentucky, talk a little bit about the process your state has been through on the issue of making IDs available. I know that there was um, quite a bit of focus on Mississippi right after the ID requirement was put in place, but I know that that has changed over time. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how that's evolved and where you are now. And then maybe Josh, you can do the same with the new law in Kentucky. So here we, we haven't made much progress. There was a lot of focus after the initial voter ID law passed. Um, there was a lot of confusion, of course, a lot of pushback. And as a result of that, um, Secretary of State and the legislator came up with a acceptable voter ID card that is issued at the circuit clerk's office on the local level or at a commissioner's office. There hasn't been much of a push uh, lately, the last several years to either reform that or either to push that out. It's more, have, it's been more centered around the acceptable forms of ID that the state requires. And that's kind of the last alternative. And so you don't hear a lot of talk about that. There's not more of an education piece about that. It's more so what the state initially means, they driver's license, uh, military ID, uh, a permit ID that you can use and so that ID piece that if you don't have any of those, it's kind of like a last option here, but there hadn't been a lot of progress around that to, to push that out more and to educate voters. So we're kind of at a standstill on that. It's more of either you have it or, or you don't. And do you have, do you find you, you, you issue lots of those or is that one of those? No, we don't issue a lot of those hardly ever. I would say on an average uh, in a year, 12 month period, maybe five to 10. It's almost, oh, okay. it's almost unheard of at this point here in, in, in Hines County. We're the largest county in the state. So I don't think any of the other clerks or officers are doing much traffic around just that particular ID if you can't meet the state requirements for a driver's license. So we're at a standstill. It will be good to, to look at that again going forward and to see what the legislators can do to maybe enhance that or make it better. Josh, you've had some movement in Kentucky? Yeah, so in Kentucky, our prior law was of the non-ID or non-photo ID required variety. So a bunch of, do uh, of documentation would count to vote, including a driver's license, but you could also use um, a social security card, a credit card, which I always thought was kind of bizarre, uh, or even uh, personal recognizance uh, if the poll worker knows you. Um, when the Secretary of State, the current Secretary of State was running for office, he campaigned on a platform of photo ID laws for voting. Uh, and so when he won, he used it really as a, as a political maneuver. Uh, and when he won, he wanted to implement his key campaign promise. Um, and so through a lot of discussions, and, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to, to be able to work with him on this. And, you know, my philosophy was, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't support photo ID laws for voting, because as we've already mentioned, they really don't do any good in terms of actually helping the electoral process, and, and they can do harm. But I, I think the reality is that they're here to stay. They're popular. Uh, people like them. People make, you know, say at least that uh, it, it, they think their elections are more secure. So my theory was, okay, how can, how can, if this is going to happen in a very Republican state, because this is, has become such a, a polarized and, and partisan issue, uh, how can we do so in a way that's going to harm voters the least, and also perhaps use it as a launching pad for, 
further reforms. Uh, and so this is what I, I sometimes refer to as the great election compromise. You know, you hear the word compromise in the negative sense of politicians are compromising our election uh, and, our, and our election laws to try to entrench themselves in power, uh, but we can also have compromise in the good sense, where we, we give in a little on something that we don't maybe necessarily agree with, but in exchange get something that we think is going to be really helpful. And, and I think Kentucky did that. So the new photo ID law does require a photo uh, with your ID, but it has provisions like there doesn't need to be an expiration date at all. So your uh, ID that's been expired for years counts. Uh, any university ID counts. Uh, even if it's from a university outside of Kentucky. Um, obviously, any uh, ID issued by the U.S. government, military and otherwise, any ID issued by a local government uh, in Kentucky, all of those qualify. And again, no, uh, no expiration date required. So you just need a name and photo. Uh, and this, this went back and forth. There was tons of drafts of the law. And uh, for those who want a detailed, uh, uh, maybe too detailed description, I, I wrote a law review article actually about uh, this called How the Sausage is Made, uh, which you can find. Uh, but the uh, end result is a law that says if you show up, you need an ID with a photo and your name, uh, one of these, you know, on, on this various list. So the Secretary of State uh, can say that he got a photo ID law. But also, as we already mentioned, um, the if you show up and you don't have an ID, you can, you can show, you do have to show a non-photo -photo ID, like a social security card or something, something with your name on it essentially. And then you can fill out that affidavit and vote a regular ballot. Um, and also personal recognizance is still allowed uh, because this is used a lot in rural counties where basically everyone knows each other. And the other important point is that this then became a catalyst for uh, further election reforms to expand access to the ballot. And so, you know, they got the integrity measure, the so-called integrity measure with photo ID, but this led to being able to have conversations across the aisle about things like early voting, uh, about things like online uh, absentee ballot, an online absentee ballot portal to be able to request your ballot where the state can also uh, tracking. So we actually got a whole suite of uh, election reforms. Um, and, and uh, you know, and although they don't, don't go as far as I would like in terms of the pro voter policies, uh, they didn't go as, as bad as I was fearful in terms of the negative uh, policies. And, and we found a nice compromise, I think, that we can then also use for even future uh, reforms. And it's really nice to see uh, Kentucky get some national press about these compromises, because I, I think it is a model for how election reform really should be done. So let me pivot away a little bit from voter ID since we've talked about that um, quite a bit. Um, in states that don't have voter ID or even in states that do and folks are concerned about uh, the integrity of the process, how can state and local election officials and probably local election officials help tell the story about how voter registration contributes to a well-run and uh, a well-run election with integrity. I guess I'll chime in real quick. I mean, I, I, I think the ultimate, the, the, the first kind of guiding principle needs to be transparency. Um, that everything that you do, a voter record is public, at least portions of it, um, that's used by the public. I think I, I saw some I saw some things. I know there's generally concern about so-called voter purges. And um, the term voter purge actually doesn't have a real legal meaning. It's it's a the term is usually list maintenance. And there is there is good list maintenance and there is bad list maintenance. If you do good list maintenance, you're keeping voter records up to date. If you're doing bad list maintenance, you're either not doing, not taking the people who are no longer eligible in your state off the list, or you are taking people who are still eligible off the list. And that's really bad, or you're keeping bad information on the list. What I saw in this last couple of years is an effort by states that had been criticized for voter so-called voter purges. Uh, I think Georgia is a pretty good example here. Um, uh, first of all, re start looking for better data. Georgia joined Eric in, in the last year. Um, they're going to use it for the first time this year. Start looking for better data so you can keep their voter lists up to date. But very importantly, states like Georgia, Ohio did this also. That when they did list maintenance, when they started cleaning up their lists, they, they first of all did it in an odd numbered year. This is very important in my mind. If you're gonna do it every two years, do it in an odd numbered year, because if there's something that goes wrong, 
that person still has a year to get re-registered and you can minimize the negative impact and hopefully you don't have anything go wrong. And then secondly, they published the entire list of records that were flagged for removal on the internet so that anyone could review them. And there were many, many excellent groups that looked at these lists and assisted voters, tried to track these people down, tried to confirm it. I mean, they ultimately, if you try to do list maintenance perfectly, if you have the best of intentions, you want all your eligible voters on the list, it's still hard because the data matching that goes into uh, finding David Becker on one list and David Becker on another list and saying, we know for sure this is the same human being, even though they, they live at different places, for instance, that's hard to do. And in fact, when we see um, people raising concerns about the voter list having ineligible voters, what they usually do is they do really shoddy um, matching of names. So they have vastly inflated numbers. We saw this famously in Georgia after the election where they alleged about 10,000 dead people were on the list. And one by one state legislatures just skewered their, uh, their claims by presenting the people who were actually alive. There was uh, the Georgia Secretary of State actually found only two and they had both recently passed away and the, their ballots had been cast by their, uh, by their spouses. Um, so uh, not, really, not really a widespread conspiracy by any, by any means. So understanding the data challenges and then trying to make sure with an understanding that there, it, 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 it's likely not to be perfect, that you do it in such a way as to minimize the danger that you might take an eligible voter accidentally off the list. Um, it's better to leave someone on the list who shouldn't be on there than to take someone off the list that should be on there. Because the likelihood is that person's never going to vote. We know that from extensive research. If someone moves from Georgia to California, it's very unlikely they're gonna to try to vote in Georgia, um, almost to the point of zero. Anybody else on that subject of voter registration as an integrity tool? I think Piggyback on what David said, um, transparency, the importance of accurate information when we're talking to voters or people that are potentially registering, um, and the importance of keeping that information updated from a, a voter standpoint. You know, um, I tell voters a lot of time, we we do a lot of the maintenance, but you, you do have a responsibility too if you move out of the county, out of the state, you're no longer where you say you are, you know, you have that option and to call us, put it in writing or that we can go ahead and update that. So um, we try to stress the importance of accurate updated information in between elections, not just an influx right around election time, but that, that maintenance in between elections. You know, this is a good example of um, how compromise can achieve the, the, the goals of both access and integrity at the exact same time. So automatic voter registration, when done correctly, when done the right way, is both an access enhancing measure because it brings people uh, onto the voter rolls and, and makes it so that they don't have to do you know, the activity themselves, but it also helps clean up the voter rolls uh, because we know when people move uh, that their registrations can be updated dynamically. And you know, so, so for, for those who are you know, nervous about automatic voter registration and you know, the, the possibility of all of these people who didn't ask initially to be registered to be put on the rolls, I would pitch it as it's actually an integrity measure. It's actually a way for the state to clean up the voter rolls in, in a way that is, is smart uh, and actually does a good job when implemented the correct way like many states uh, have done already. I, I just wanna say really quickly, that's a great point that Josh just raised. If you look at the data from states that have done automatic voter registration or automated voter voter or really integrated data between DMVs and elections, the largest category of transactions by far is the update of existing registrations because someone has had an in-state move. This is an integrity measure. You know where they are, you know you're getting them the right information. And it's it also gets people who've just moved into the state or newly become eligible, perhaps because they turned 18, gets them onto the voter list very easily as well. But the largest category is people who have had a life event. They have moved, they have changed their name, they needed to update their gender identity or something of that sort that is th those are huge advent ad advantages in uh in for integrity out of these kinds of procedures and i will point out as a lifelong virginian and recognizing the kentuckian and the mississippian on the call that odd numbers years aren't always the best time to do election changes in states that have odd year elections but uh, i think you're absolutely right that finding what passes for a quiet time to do that is always helpful 
Um, I have a question um, from the audience about, uh, about federal requirements that I want to uh, change a little bit and ask when we're making policy changes in elections, and specifically in this case, in voter ID and voter registration, we often see those changes being driven by the legislature and imposed or imposed upon or required of um, the election community. Um, wondering what the panel generally thinks about the notion of uh, allowing election officials and people who work in this space to help drive reform and ask their legislators for changes rather than react to changes being proposed to them. I guess my, my, my bumper sticker question is, um, should we listen to election officials? And if so, how do we make that happen? Tony, Absolutely. I'll give you, yeah, I'll <laughs> Absolutely. Give you the, I'll give you the first right. We, we here have a coalition of nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organizations that talk about election law, Medicaid expansion, just a plethora of issues. We have started those conversations uh, with our, our Secretary of State, uh, trying to have open lines of communications, but most importantly, our legislators. During the session, uh, when there are election hearings going on, when there are things um, being the pertinent decisions being made about election law and voter ID laws and changes in qualification deadlines for election officials, the whole nine. We have a organization here statewide of election officials, uh, which is a, a, a 501c3. We hold um, annual meetings several times a year. We have an annual conference that we talk about a legislative agenda and what that looks like from the good standpoint of things that we see working as well as the bad. In turn, we take that particular committee and we lobby and we work with our legislators. Being elected, you've got legislators from all across the, the state that you have access to. So uh, we're constantly networking with them during the session, out of the session, but most importantly, we've got a collective body of election officials that talk about the pros and cons and what's working, what hadn't working, what we would like to see. And we have an agenda of probably about 20, 25 items. We've probably seen about four or five of those come off the last couple of sessions from small pay raises to election officials to uh, staggering terms so that you wouldn't have a slate of all new election officials coming in at one time. So we found that to be the best effective way to communicate with our legislators and, and they listen. And a plus to that is we've got a couple former election officials that are now in the legislature that know what it's like to kind of be in our shoes. So they're typically on your election committees here, and that's a plus for us. I, I don't want to. I'm I'm a little bit of a pessimist about this because absolutely Tony is right. I mean, I, I think all of us would agree it, one of the most important things to do when fashioning election administration policy is to um, listen to the professional election administrators at the state and local level. And, um, you know, we heard a great example from Kentucky where that was done, where Republicans and Democrats talked to each other, where they brought in experts like Josh. Um, but then there are other examples going on right now in this highly divided um, uh, kind of system that we find ourselves in. You know, in, for instance, in Florida, which by 2020 was running model elections for the nation. I mean, honestly, the way Florida was running elections after everything they had been through was really remarkable. Um, they held easily their highest turnout, most secure election ever. And that's because they allowed easy access to early in-person voting, mail voting, and election day voting. And election officials who were elected in, in Florida, unlike some states, many states, at the county level, and they're elected as partisans, so they're Democratic and Republican supervisors of elections, did just a remarkable job. And then the legislature has decided they want to make it harder to vote, particularly by mail, by restricting, for instance, access to drop boxes um, in the state of uh, in the state of Florida. And many supervisors, including Republican supervisors of elections, including one Republican supervisor who had formerly served in the Florida State Senate, who had to testify before his colleagues and say, this is a bad idea, do not restrict drop boxes. Do, allow us to use them, allow them to be open uh, beyond early voting hours, allow them to be freestanding. Um, unfortunately, that has not held the day. Um, the legislators are not even listening to their former colleagues of the same party who are election professionals. I'm hoping that changes because the election professionals across the political spectrum are the experts here. They all want to have elections with, with integrity, and um, but they also know how they can do it. Okay, I want to give everybody a chance to, to chime in. Um, 
I, another question that, that's come up um, that um, we haven't really talked about, but I know has been an issue um, in um, several states is the idea of proof of citizenship um, for um, voter registration uh, and the like. Um, we could go for another 90 minutes plus on whether or not proof of citizenship is necessary, um, but if a legislature thought that was important along the lines of our voter ID discussion, is there a meaningful way to do that? And are there states out there that are already collecting data or have some kind of record which demonstrates the requisite citizenship of uh, a new or updated voter? Well, I can say that uh, regarding uh, Arizona, which uh, I believe is the only state that has uh, a, a proof of citizenship to register to vote law still in place, or in a, that's in force, let me put it that way. Um, <clears throat> at this point, under a consent decree, uh, if, if uh, you, uh, it, it, in order to vote in a state or local election, you, uh, you need to provide documentary proof of citizenship to, 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 to register to vote, to complete your voter registration. Uh, if you haven't done so, you can still vote in federal elections. Um, uh, and there are laws, I, I think in Georgia and Alabama, uh, that still have that, but they've never really gone into effect. And of course, Kansas had one that was overturned in the courts. So um, I, again, knowing how difficult it is uh, for, for people to obtain, uh, you know, a certified copy of their birth certificate, um, <clears throat> it's problematic. And we haven't even discussed the fact that there are, you know, tens and tens of thousands of American citizens who do not have an official birth certificate. Okay, they were, they, you know, African Americans born uh, in the rural South that up to a certain point weren't allowed in in, in hospitals. Okay, so all of these people have been born, uh, have been delivered by midwife. Um, uh, you know. Oftentimes, there is no official birth certificate, and to uh, create an official birth certificate, which is called a delayed birth certificate in 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 the states, uh, is an incredibly lengthy. It takes you know a year or two. I, trust me, it takes a lawyer. It so it's very expensive. It's really really complicated. I just also say uh, um, that there is a there there is no magic database, as I said before. There's no magic list. There is no place with citizenship data on everybody in the United States with accurate address information, which is necessary for voting. And so there have been attempts to try to um, to, to to force proof of citizenship, but as Kathleen really really well stated, um, there is many just don't have that easy to access. It's very difficult for them to get. And, um, and in many states, in fact, you will find that even their motor vehicles databases don't have good comprehensive information on who's a citizen and who's, who is not. Um, you know, I remembered, uh, this is changing, um, but Oregon, for instance, had very, very robust data on citizenship that had been collecting for years. And Washington, its neighbor, had zero um, for years, because they they were just not collecting it. I mean, sometimes it's not even a policy decision. Sometimes it's just can the database have it? Does the database have a field that holds that information? Um, so all of these things are a lot harder than um, than people imagine because they're data questions. Um, and more importantly, it gets back to Josh's question, which is why are we doing this? I mean, do we have any evidence that there is widespread voting or attempted voting by people who are not eligible citizens? The answer is no. If you're, if you're not an eligible citizen, it is incredibly dumb 
to put your citizenship status in jeopardy and call, call attention to yourself for the simple act of casting a vote. And every time it's been found, and it's been found only a handful of times here or there, or someone accidentally getting registered, it was an accident. It was someone had told someone that they could, they could get registered. It was because the DMV had accidentally checked a box or something like that. It, it is, I can't think of a single instance where I, that I know of um, where an Ill, ineligible non-citizen has intentionally gotten registered to in an effort to try to cast a ballot. And to David's point, there are a few cities that allow non-citizens to vote in local elections or in school board elections. Um, you know, San Francisco comes to mind as, as one that has enfranchised non-citizens in school board elections because their kids validly go to school. And yet the voting rate of non-citizens in those elections, when they're explicitly allowed to pass about, is actually pretty low. Um, and I think it's because, you know, non-citizens are very nervous about doing anything that might put their citizenship status into question. And so even though the law in those places, and there's a handful of cities in Maryland also where non-citizens can vote in local elections, even though, though the law allows it, the voting rates are actually quite low for the exact reason that David mentioned. Well, wonderful. I really want to thank the panel. Um, like I said, I think we could go on for another 90 minutes or more um, on these issues. And I'm really delighted that the four of you um, were able to join us. Um, it's been a really great discussion. Um, we've talked a lot um, in putting these panels together about the importance of bringing back this spirit of bipartisan and reasonable conversation around election issues. Um, and I, I really sincerely wanna thank the four of you um, for your contribution to that. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues um, to close us out and to let folks know about our next uh, panel uh, in a couple of weeks. David? Thank you, Doug. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and thanks to uh, all the panel members for a very thoughtful conversation and for sharing your insights. Uh, Carter Center and Baker Institute think that these are exactly the kinds of exchanges that will help bring about bipartisan approaches to you know, help us address the problems facing US elections. We hope um, that you can join us for our, the next session, which will be uh, exceptionally on a Monday, Monday, uh, May 17th at 1230. The topic is electoral technology. So we hope to see you then. Uh, until then, I join uh, my colleague at the Baker Institute, John Williams, and asking you to stay healthy, get your vaccinations, and continue to observe uh, recommendations to wear masks and maintain social distancing. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.